Ananda 5th, 4th centuries BCE was the primary attendant of the Buddha and one of his ten principal disciples. Among the Buddha's many disciples, Ananda stood out for having the best memory. Most of the texts of the early Buddhist Sutta Pitaka Pali, Sanskrit, Sutra Pitaka are attributed to his recollection of the Buddha's teachings during the First Buddhist Council. For that reason, he is known as the treasurer of the Dhamma, with Dhamma Sanskrit, Dharma referring to the Buddha's teaching. In early Buddhist texts, Ananda is the first cousin of the Buddha. Although the early texts do not agree on many parts of Ananda's early life, they do agree that Ananda is ordained as a monk and that Punamantaniputta Sanskrit, Purna becomes his teacher. Twenty years in the Buddha's ministry, Ananda becomes the attendant of the Buddha, when the Buddha selects him for this task. Ananda performs his duties with great devotion and care, and acts as an intermediary between the Buddha and the laypeople, as well as the Sangha Sanskrit, Samga, lit. Monastic community. He accompanies the Buddha for the rest of his life, acting not only as an assistant, but also a secretary and a mouthpiece. Scholars are skeptical about the historicity of many events in Ananda's life, especially the First Council, and consensus about this has yet to be established. A traditional account can be drawn from early texts, commentaries, and post-canonical chronicles. Ananda has an important role in establishing the order of bhikkhunis Sanskrit, bisuni, lit. Nun, when he requests the Buddha on behalf of the latter's foster mother Mahapajapati Gotami Sanskrit, Mahaprajapati Gautami to allow her to be ordained. Ananda also accompanies the Buddha in the last year of his life, and therefore is witness to many tenets and principles that the Buddha conveys before his death, including the well-known principle that the Buddhist community should take his teaching and discipline as their refuge, and that he will not appoint a new leader. The final period of the Buddha's life also shows that Ananda is very much attached to the Buddha's person, and he sees the Buddha's passing with great sorrow. Shortly after the Buddha's death, the first council is convened, and Ananda manages to attain enlightenment just before the council starts, which is a requirement. He has a historical role during the council as the living memory of the Buddha, reciting many of the Buddha's discourses and checking them for accuracy. During the same council, however, he is chastised by Mahakasapa Sanskrit, Mahakasyapa and the rest of the Sangha for allowing women to be ordained and failing to understand or respect the Buddha at several crucial moments. Ananda continues to teach until the end of his life, passing on his spiritual heritage to his pupils Sanavasi Sanskrit, Sanakavasi and Majantaka Sanskrit, Madhyantaka, among others, who later assume a leading role in the second and third councils. Ananda dies 20 years after the Buddha, and stupas monuments are erected at the river where he dies. Ananda is one of the most loved figures in Buddhism. Ananda is known for his memory, erudition and compassion, and is often praised by the Buddha for these matters. He functions as a foil to the Buddha, however, in that he still has worldly attachments and is not yet enlightened, as opposed to the Buddha. In the Sanskrit textual traditions, Ananda is considered the patriarch of the Dhamma, who stands in a spiritual lineage, receiving the teaching from Mahakasapa and passing them on to his own pupils. Ananda has been honored by bhikkhunis since early medieval times for his merits in establishing the nuns' order. In recent times, the composer Richard Wagner and Indian poet Rabindranath Tagore were inspired by stories about Ananda in their work. Name The word Ananda means bliss, joy in Pali and in Sanskrit. Pali commentaries explain that when Ananda is born, his relatives are joyous about this, and he therefore is named that way. Texts from the Mulasarvastivada tradition, however, state that since Ananda is born on the day of the Buddha's enlightenment, there is great rejoicing in the city hence the name. Accounts Previous lives According to the texts, in a previous life, Ananda makes an aspiration to become a Buddha's attendant. He makes this aspiration in the time of a previous Buddha called Padumatara, many eons before the present time. He meets the attendant of Padumatara Buddha and aspires to be like him in a future life. 
After having done many good deeds, he makes his resolution known to the Padumatara Buddha, who confirms that his wish will come true in a future life. After having been born and reborn through many lifetimes, and doing many good deeds, he is born as Ananda in the present lifetime. <laughs> present life, beginning Ananda is born in the same time period as the Buddha formerly Prince Siddhartha, which scholars place at 5th-4th centuries BCE. Tradition says that Ananda is the first cousin of the Buddha, his father being the brother of Sadodana Sanskrit, Sadodana, the Buddha's father. In the Pali and Mulasarvastivada textual traditions, his father is Amitodana Sanskrit, Amartodana, but the Mahavasta states that his father is Suklodana. Both are brothers of Sadodana. The Mahavasta also mentions that Ananda's mother's name is Murji Sanskrit, little deer, Pali is unknown. The Pali tradition has it that Ananda is born on the same day as Prince Siddhartha Sanskrit, Siddhartha, but texts from the Mulasarvastivada and subsequent Mahayana traditions state Ananda is born at the same time the Buddha attains enlightenment when Prince Siddhartha is 29 years old, and is therefore much younger than the Buddha. The latter tradition is corroborated by several instances in the early Buddhist texts, in which Ananda appears younger than the Buddha, such as the passage in which the Buddha explains to Ananda how old age is affecting him in body and mind. It is also corroborated by a verse in the Pali text called Theragatha, in which Ananda states he was a learner. For 25 years, after which he attended the Buddha for another 25 years. Following the Pali, Mahisasaka, and Dharmaguptaka textual traditions, Ananda becomes a monk in the second year of the Buddha's ministry, during the Buddha's visit to Kapilavatu. Sanskrit, Kapilavasta. He is ordained by the Buddha himself, together with many other princes of the Buddha's clan, Pali, Sakya, Sanskrit, Sakya, in the mango grove called Anupya, part of Mala territory. According to a text from the Mahasangika tradition, King Suddhodana wants the Buddha to have more followers of the Khatiya caste Sanskrit, Kasatriya, lit. warrior noble, member of the ruling class, and less from the Brahmin priest caste. He therefore orders that any Khatiya who has a brother must follow the Buddha as a monk, or have his brother do so. Ananda uses this opportunity with great joy, and asks his brother Devadatta to stay at home, so that he can leave it for the monkhood. The later timeline from the Mulasarvastivada texts and the Pali Theragatha, however, have Ananda ordained much later, about 25 years before the Buddha's death—in other words, 20 years in the Buddha's ministry. Some Sanskrit sources have him ordained even later. The Muladharvastavada texts on monastic discipline Pali and Sanskrit, Vinaya, relate that soothsayers predict Ananda will be the Buddha's attendant. In order to prevent Ananda from leaving the palace to ordain, his father brings him to Vasali Sanskrit, Vaisali during the Buddha's visit to Kapilavatu, but the Buddha meets and teaches Ananda later. When Ananda does become ordained, his father has him ordain in Kapilavatu in the Nigrodharama Monastery Sanskrit, Niagradharama with much ceremony, Ananda's preceptor Pali, Upajaya, Sanskrit, Upadaya being a certain Dasabala Kasyapa. The Mahavasta relates that Murji is initially opposed to Ananda joining the holy life, because his brother Devadatta has already ordained and left the palace. Ananda responds to his mother's resistance by moving to Videha Sanskrit, Vediha, and lives there, taking a vow of silence. This leads him to gain the epithet Vidihamuni Sanskrit, Vedihamuni, meaning the silent wise one from Videha. According to the Pali tradition, Ananda's first teachers are Belathasisa and Punna it is Punna's teaching that leads Ananda to attain the stage of Sotapanna Sanskrit, Shrotapanna, an attainment preceding that of enlightenment. Ananda later expresses his debt to Punna. Another important figure in the life of Ananda is Sariputta Sanskrit, Sariputra, one of the Buddha's main disciples. Sariputta often teaches Ananda about the finer points of Buddhist doctrine, they are in the habit of sharing things with one another, and their relationship is described as a good friendship. In some Mulasarvastavada texts, an attendant of Ananda is also mentioned who helps encourage Ananda when he is banned from the first Buddhist council. He is a Vajiputta, Sanskrit, Vajiputra, i.e. someone who originates from the Vaji confederacy. According to later texts, an enlightened monk called Vajiputta Sanskrit, Vajraputra has an important role in Ananda's life. He listens to a teaching of Ananda and realizes that Ananda is not enlightened yet. 
Vajiputta encourages Ananda to talk less to laypeople and to deepen his meditation practice by retreating in the forest, an advice that very much affects Ananda. Attending the Buddha In the first twenty years of the Buddha's ministry, the Buddha has several personal attendants. However, after these twenty years, when the Buddha is aged fifty-five, the Buddha announces that he has need for a permanent attendant. The Buddha has been growing older, and his previous attendants did not do their job very well. Initially, several of the Buddha's foremost disciples respond to his request, but the Buddha does not accept them. All the while Ananda remains quiet. When he is asked why, he says that the Buddha will know best who to choose, upon which the Buddha responds by choosing Ananda. Ananda agrees to take on the position, on the condition that he does not receive any material benefits from the Buddha. Accepting such benefits would open him up to criticism that he chose the position because of ulterior motives. He also requests that the Buddha allows him to accept invitations on his behalf, allows him to ask questions about his doctrine, and repeats any teaching that has been taught in Ananda's absence. These requests would help people trust Ananda and show that the Buddha was sympathetic to his attendant. Furthermore, Ananda considers these the real advantages of being an attendant, which is why he requests them. The Buddha agrees to Ananda's conditions, and Ananda becomes the Buddha's attendant, accompanying the Buddha on most of his wanderings. Ananda takes care of the Buddha's daily practical needs, by doing things such as bringing water and cleaning the Buddha's dwelling place. He is depicted as observant and devoted, even guarding the Buddha's dwelling place at night. Ananda takes the part of interlocutor in many of the recorded dialogues. He attends the Buddha for a total of 25 years, a duty which entails much work. His relationship with the Buddha is depicted as warm and trusting. When the Buddha grows ill, Ananda has a sympathetic illness. When the Buddha grows older, Ananda keeps taking care of him with devotion. Ananda sometimes literally risks his life for his master. At one time, the rebellious monk Devadatta tries to kill the Buddha by having a drunk and wild elephant released in the Buddha's presence. Ananda steps in front of the Buddha to protect him. When the Buddha tells him to move, he refuses, although normally he always obeys the Buddha. Through a supernatural accomplishment Pali, IDDHI, Sanskrit, Riddhi, the Buddha then moves Ananda aside and brings the elephant down, by touching it and speaking to it with loving kindness. Ananda often acts as an intermediary and secretary, passing on messages from the Buddha, informing the Buddha of news, invitations, or the needs of lay people, and advising lay people who want to provide gifts to the Sangha. At one time, Mahapajapati, the Buddha's foster mother, requests to offer robes for personal use for the Buddha. She says that even though she has raised the Buddha in his youth, she never gave anything in person to the young prince, she now wishes to do so. The Buddha initially insists that she give the robe to the community as a whole rather than to be attached to his person. However, Ananda intercedes and mediates, arguing that the Buddha better accept the robe. Eventually the Buddha does, but not without pointing out to Ananda that good deeds like giving should always be done for the sake of the action itself, not for the sake of the person. The texts say that the Buddha sometimes asks Ananda to substitute for him as teacher, and is often praised by the Buddha for his teachings. Ananda is often given important teaching roles, such as regularly teaching Queen Malika, Queen Samavati, Sanskrit, Siamavati, and other people from the ruling class. Once Ananda teaches a number of King Udina Sanskrit, Udayana s concubines. They are so impressed by Ananda's teaching, that they give him 500 robes, which Ananda accepts. Having heard about this, King Udina criticizes Ananda for being greedy. Ananda responds by explaining how every single robe is carefully used, reused and recycled by the monastic community, prompting the king to offer another 500 robes. Ananda also has a role in the Buddha's visit to Visali. In this story, the Buddha teaches the well-known text Ratana Sutta to Ananda, which Ananda then recites in Visali, ridding the city from illness, drought and evil spirits in the process. Another well-known passage in which the Buddha teaches Ananda is the passage about spiritual friendship Pali, Kalyanamatada. In this passage, Ananda states that spiritual friendship is half of the holy life. The Buddha corrects Ananda, stating that such friendship is the entire holy life. In summary, Ananda works as an assistant, intermediary and a mouthpiece, helping the Buddha in many ways, and learning his teachings in the process. 
Topic: <laughs> Resisting temptations. Ananda is attractive in appearance. A Pali account relates that a bhikkhuni becomes enamored with Ananda, and pretends to be ill to have Ananda visit her. When she realizes the error of her ways, she confesses her mistakes to Ananda. Other accounts relate that a low caste woman called Prakirti falls in love with Ananda, and persuades her mother Matangi to use a black magic spell to enchant him. This succeeds, and Ananda is lured into her house, but comes to his senses and calls upon the help of the Buddha. The Buddha then teaches Prakirti to reflect on the repulsive qualities of the human body, and eventually Prakirti is ordained as a bhikkhuni, giving up her attachment for Ananda. In an East Asian version of the story in the Sutra, the Buddha sends Manyasri to help Ananda, who uses recitation to counter the magic charm. The Buddha then continues to teach Ananda and other listeners about the Buddha nature. Establishing the nun's order In the role of mediator between the Buddha and the lay communities, Ananda sometimes makes suggestions to the Buddha for amendments in the monastic discipline. Most importantly, the early texts attribute the inclusion of women in the early Sangha monastic order to Ananda. Fifteen years after the Buddha's enlightenment, his foster mother Mahapajapati comes to see him to ask him to be ordained as the first Buddhist bhikkhuni. Initially, the Buddha refuses this. Five years later, Mahapajapati comes to request the Buddha again, this time with a following of other Sakya women, including the Buddha's former wife Yasodhara Sanskrit, Yasodhara. They have walked 500 kilometers 310 miles, look dirty, tired and depressed, and Ananda feels pity for them. Ananda therefore confirms with the Buddha whether women can become enlightened as well. Although the Buddha concedes this, he does not allow the Sakya women to be ordained yet. Ananda then discusses with the Buddha how Mahapajapati took care of him during his childhood, after the death of his real mother. Ananda also mentions that previous Buddhas have also ordained bhikkhunis. In the end, the Buddha allows the Sakya women to be ordained, being the start of the bhikkhuni order. Ananda has Mahapajapati ordained by her acceptance of a set of rules, set by the Buddha. These are known as the Garudhamma, and they describe the subordinate relation of the bhikkhuni community to that of the bhikkhus or monks. Asian religion scholar Reiko Onuma argues that the debt the Buddha had toward his foster mother Mahapajapati may have been the main reason for his concessions with regard to the establishment of a bhikkhuni order. Many scholars interpret this account to mean that the Buddha is reluctant in allowing women to be ordained, and that Ananda successfully persuaded the Buddha to change his mind. For example, Indologist and translator I. B. Horner wrote that, "...this is the only instance of his being over-persuaded in argument." However, some scholars interpret the Buddha's initial refusal rather as a test of resolve, following a widespread pattern in the Pali Canon and in monastic procedure of repeating a request three times before final acceptance. Some also argue that the Buddha was believed by Buddhists to be omniscient, and therefore is unlikely to have been depicted as changing his mind. Other scholars argue that other passages in the texts indicate the Buddha intends all along to establish a bhikkhuni order. Regardless, during the acceptance of women into the monastic order, the Buddha tells Ananda that the Buddha's dispensation will last shorter because of this reason. At the time, the Buddhist monastic order consisted of wandering celibate males, without many monastic institutions. Allowing women to join the Buddhist celibate life might have led to dissension, as well as temptation between the sexes. The Garudhamma, however, are meant to fix these problems, and prevent the dispensation from being curtailed. There are some chronological discrepancies in the traditional account of the setting up of the bhikkhuni order. According to the Pali and Mahisasaka textual traditions, the bhikkhuni order is set up five years after the Buddha's enlightenment, but Ananda only becomes attendant twenty years after the Buddha's enlightenment. Furthermore, Mahapajapati is the Buddha's foster mother, and must therefore be considerably older than him. However, after the bhikkhuni order is established, Mahapajapati still has many audiences with the Buddha, as reported in Pali and Chinese early Buddhist texts. Because of this and other reasons, it could be inferred that establishment of the bhikkhuni order actually takes place early in the Buddha's ministry. If this is the case, Ananda's role in establishing the order becomes less likely. 
Some scholars therefore interpret the names in the account, such as Ananda and Mahapajapati, as symbols, representing groups rather than specific individuals. According to the texts, Ananda's role in founding the Bhikkhuni order makes him popular with the Bhikkhuni community. Ananda often teaches bhikkhunis, often encourages women to ordain, and when he is criticized by the monk Mahakasapa, several bhikkhunis try to defend him. According to Indologist Oscar von Hinuber, Ananda's pro bhikkhuni attitude may well be the reason why there is frequent discussion between Ananda and Mahakasapa, eventually leading Mahakasapa to charge Ananda with several offenses during the First Buddhist Council. Hinuber further argues that the establishment of the Bhikkhuni order may have well been initiated by Ananda after the Buddha's death, and the introduction of Mahapajapati as the person requesting to do so is merely a literary device to connect the female ordination with the Buddha through his foster mother. Hinuber concludes this based on several patterns in the early texts, including the apparent distance between the Buddha and the Bhikkhuni order, and the frequent discussions and differences of opinion that take place between Ananda and Mahakasapa. Some scholars have seen merits in von Hinuber's argument with regard to the pro and anti factions, but as of 2017, no definitive evidence has been found for the theory of establishment after the Buddha's death. Buddhist studies scholar Bhikkhu Anilayo has responded to most of Hinuber's arguments, writing, Besides requiring too many assumptions, this hypothesis conflicts with nearly all the evidence preserved in the texts together. Arguing that it is monastic discipline that created a distance between the Buddha and the bhikkhunis, and even so, there are many places in the early texts where the Buddha does address bhikkhunis directly. The Buddha's death Despite his long association with and close proximity to the Buddha, the texts describe that Ananda has not become enlightened yet. Because of that a fellow monk Udayi Sanskrit, Udayan ridicules Ananda for this. However, the Buddha reprimands Udayi in response, adding that Ananda will certainly be enlightened in this life. The Pali Maha Parinibbana Sutta relates the last year-long trip the Buddha takes with Ananda from Rajagaya Sanskrit, Rajagra to the small town of Kusinara Sanskrit, Kusingari before the Buddha dies there. Before reaching Kusinara, the Buddha spends the retreat during the monsoon Pali, Vasa, Sanskrit, Varsa in Velagama Sanskrit, Venugramaka, getting out of the Visali area which suffers from famine. Here the 80-year-old Buddha expresses his wish to speak to the Sangha once more. The Buddha has grown seriously ill in Visali, much to the concern of some of his disciples. Ananda understands that the Buddha wishes to leave final instructions before his death. The Buddha replies, however, that he has already taught everything needed, without withholding anything secret as a teacher with a closed fist would. He also impresses upon Ananda that he does not think the Sangha should be reliant too much on a leader, not even himself. He then continues with the well-known statement to take his teaching as a refuge, and oneself as a refuge, without relying on any other refuge, also after the Buddha is gone. Burrow argues that this is one of the most ancient parts of the text, found in slight variation in five early textual traditions. Moreover, this very beautiful episode, touching with nobility and psychological verisimilitude with regard to both Ananda and the Buddha, seems to go back very far, at the time when the authors, like the other disciples, still considered the Blessed One, the Buddha, a man, an eminently respectable and undefiled master, to whom behavior and utterly human words were lent, so that one is even tempted to see there the memory of a real scene which Ananda reportedly told to the community in the months following the Parinirvana death. The same text contains an account in which the Buddha, at numerous occasions, gives a hint that he could prolong his life to a full eon through a supernatural accomplishment, but this is a power that he must be asked to exercise. Ananda is distracted, however, and does not take the hint. Later, Ananda does make the request, but the Buddha replies that it is already too late, as he will die soon. Mara, the Buddhist personification of evil, has visited the Buddha, and the Buddha has decided to die after three months. When Ananda hears this, he weeps. The Buddha consoles him, however, pointing out that Ananda has been a great attendant, being sensitive to the needs of different people. If he is earnest in his efforts, he will attain enlightenment soon. He then points out to Ananda that all conditioned things are impermanent, all people must die. In the final days of the Buddha's life, the Buddha travels to Kusinara. 
The Buddha has Ananda prepare a place for lying down between two sal trees, the same type of tree under which the mother of the Buddha gave birth. The Buddha then has Ananda invite the Mala clan from Kuzanara to pay their final respects. Having returned, Ananda asks the Buddha what should be done with his body after his death, and he replies that it should be cremated, giving detailed instructions on how this should be done. Since the Buddha prohibits Ananda from being involved himself, but rather has him instruct the malas to perform the rituals, these instructions have by many scholars been interpreted as a prohibition in Buddhism that monastics should not be involved in funerals or worship of stupas structures with relics. Buddhist studies scholar Gregory Chopin has pointed out, however, that this prohibition only holds for Ananda, and only with regard to the Buddha's funeral ceremony. It has also been shown that the instructions on the funeral are quite late in origin, in both composition and insertion into the text, and are not found in parallel texts. Apart from the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, Ananda then continues by asking how devotees should honor the Buddha after his death. The Buddha responds by listing four important places in his life that people can pay their respects to, which later become the four main places of Buddhist pilgrimage. Before the Buddha dies, Ananda recommends the Buddha to move to a more meaningful city instead, but the Buddha points out that the town was once a great capital. Ananda then asks who will be next teacher after the Buddha is gone, but the Buddha replies that his teaching and discipline will be the teacher instead. This means that decisions should be made by reaching consensus within the Sangha, and more generally, that now the time has come for the Buddhist monastics and devotees to take the Buddhist texts as authority. Instead of the Buddha and his eminent disciples, the Buddha gives several instructions before his death, including a directive that his former charioteer Channa Sanskrit, Chandaka be shunned by his fellow monks, to humble his pride. In his final moments, the Buddha asks if anyone has any questions he wishes to pose to him, as a final chance to allay any doubts. When no one responds, Ananda expresses joy that all of the Buddha's disciples present have attained a level beyond doubts about the Buddha's teaching. However, the Buddha points out that Ananda speaks out of faith and not out of meditative insight—a final reproach. He adds that, of all the five hundred monks that are surrounding him now, even the latest, or most backward, Pali, Pachimaka, has attained the initial stage of Sotapanna. Meant as an encouragement, the Buddha is referring to Ananda. During the Buddha's final nirvana, Aniruddha is able to use his meditative powers to understand which stages the Buddha undergoes before he attains final nirvana. However, Ananda is unable to do so, indicating his lesser spiritual maturity. After the Buddha's death, Ananda recites several verses, expressing a sense of urgency Pali, Samvega, deeply moved by the events and their bearing. Terrible was the quaking, men's hair stood on end, when the all-accomplished Buddha passed away. Shortly after the council, Ananda brings the message with regard to the Buddha's directive to Chana personally. Chana is humbled and changes his ways, attains enlightenment, and the penalty is withdrawn. Ananda travels to Savathi Sanskrit, Sravasti, where he is met with a sad populace, who he consoles with teachings on impermanence. After that, Ananda goes to the quarters of the Buddha and goes through the motions of the routine he formerly performed when the Buddha was still alive, such as preparing water and cleaning the quarters. He then salutes and talks to the quarters as though the Buddha was still there. The Pali commentaries state that Ananda does this out of devotion, but also because he is not yet free from the passions. The First Council Ban According to the texts, the First Buddhist Council is held in Rajagaya. In the first vasa after the Buddha has died, the presiding monk Mahakasapa Sanskrit, Mahakasyapa calls upon Ananda to recite the discourses he has heard, as a representative on this council. There is a rule issued that only enlightened disciples arahants are allowed to attend the council, to prevent mental afflictions from clouding the disciples' memories. Ananda has, however, not attained enlightenment yet, in contrast with the rest of the council, consisting of 499 arahants. Mahakasapa therefore does not allow Ananda to attend yet. Although he knows that Ananda's presence in the council is required, he does not want to be biased by allowing an exception to the rule. 
The Mulasarvastivada tradition adds that Mahakasapa initially allows Ananda to join as a sort of servant assisting during the council, but then is forced to remove him when the disciple Aniruddha sees that Ananda is not yet enlightened. Ananda feels humiliated, but is prompted to focus his efforts to reach enlightenment before the council starts. The Mulasarvastivada texts add that he feels motivated when he remembers the Buddha's words to be his own refuge, and when he is consoled and advised by Aniruddha and Vajiputta, the latter being his attendant. On the night before the event, he tries hard to attain enlightenment. After a while, Ananda takes a break and decides to lie down for a rest. He then attains enlightenment right there, right then, halfway between sitting and lying down. Thus, Ananda is known as the disciple who attained awakening. In none of the four traditional poses, walking, standing, sitting, or lying down. The next morning, to prove his enlightenment, Ananda performs a supernatural accomplishment by diving into the earth and appearing on his seat at the council, or, according to some sources, by flying through the air. Scholars such as Buddhologist Andre Burrow and religion scholar Ellison Banks Findla have been skeptical about many details in this account, including the number of participants on the council, and the account of Ananda's enlightenment just before the council. Regardless, today, the story of Ananda's struggle on the evening before the council is still told among Buddhists as a piece of advice in the practice of meditation, neither to give up, nor to interpret the practice too rigidly. Recitations The first council begins when Ananda is consulted to recite the discourses and to determine which are authentic and which are not. Mahakasapa asks of each discourse that Ananda lists where, when, and to whom it was given, and at the end of this, the assembly agrees that Ananda's memories and recitations are correct, after which the discourse collection Pali, Sutta Pitaka, Sanskrit, Sutra Pitaka is considered finalized and closed. Ananda therefore plays a crucial role in this council, and texts claim he remembers 84,000 teaching topics, among which 82,000 taught by the Buddha and another 2,000 taught by disciples. Many early Buddhist discourses start with the words, Thus have I heard. Pali, eva mi suttam, Sanskrit, eva maya srutam, which according to most Buddhist traditions, are Ananda's words, indicating that he, as the person reporting the text Sanskrit, Samidikara, had first-hand experience and did not add anything to it. Thus, the discourses Ananda remembers later become the collection of discourses of the canon, and according to the Haimavada, Dharmaguptaka and Sarvastivada textual traditions and implicitly, post-canonical Pali chronicles, the collection of Abhidhamma, Abhidhamma Pataka as well. Religious studies scholar Ronald Davidson notes, however, that this is not preceded by any account of Ananda learning Abhidhamma. According to some later Mahayana accounts, Ananda also assists in reciting Mahayana texts, held in a different place in Rajagaya, but in the same time period. The Pali commentaries state that after the council, as the tasks for recitation and memorizing the texts are divided, Ananda, and his pupils are given the task to remember the Diga Nikaya. Charges <laughs> 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 During the same council, Ananda is charged for an offense by members of the Sangha for having enabled women to join the monastic order. Besides this, he is charged for having forgotten to request the Buddha to specify which offenses of monastic discipline could be disregarded, for having stepped on the Buddha's robe, for having allowed women to honor the Buddha's body after his death, which was naked, and during which his body was sullied by their tears, and for having failed to ask the Buddha to continue to live on. Ananda does not acknowledge these as offenses, but he concedes to do a formal confession anyway. In faith of the opinion of the venerable elder monks. Ananda wants to prevent disruption in the Sangha. With regard to having women ordained, Ananda answers that he worked hard for that because Mahapajapati was the Buddha's foster mother who had long provided for him. With regard to not requesting the Buddha to continue to live, many textual traditions have Ananda respond by saying he was distracted by Mara, though one early Chinese text has Ananda reply he did not request the Buddha to prolong his life, for fear that this would interfere with the next Buddha Maitreya's ministry. According to the Pali tradition, the charges are laid after Ananda has become enlightened and done all the recitations, but the Mulasarvastivada tradition has it that the charges are laid before Ananda becomes enlightened and starts the recitations. 
In this version, when Ananda hears that he is banned from the council, he objects that he has not done anything that goes against the teaching and discipline of the Buddha. Mahakasapa then lists seven charges to counter Ananda's objection. The charges are similar to the five given in Pali. Other textual traditions list slightly different charges, amounting to a combined total of eleven charges, some of which are only mentioned in one or two textual traditions. Considering that an enlightened disciple was seen to have overcome all faults, it seems more likely that the charges were laid before Ananda's attainment than after. Indologists von Hinuber and Jean Perzaluski argue that the account of Ananda being charged with offences during the council indicate tensions between competing early Buddhist schools, i.e., schools that emphasized the discourses Pali, Sutta, Sanskrit, Sutra, and schools that emphasized monastic discipline. These differences have affected the scriptures of each tradition, e.g. the Pali and Mahisasaka textual traditions portray a Mahakasapa that is more critical of Ananda than that the Sarvastivada tradition depicts them, reflecting a preference for discipline above discourse on the part of the former traditions, and a preference for discourse for the latter. Another example is the recitations during the First Council. The Pali texts state that Upali, the person who is responsible for the recitation of the monastic discipline, recites before Ananda does, again, monastic discipline above discourse. Analyzing six textual traditions of the Mahaparinibbana Sutta extensively, Barrow distinguished two layers in the text, an older and a newer one, the former belonging to the compilers that emphasized discourse, the latter to the ones that emphasized discipline, the former emphasizing the figure of Ananda, the latter Mahakasapa. He further argued that the passage on Mara obstructing the Buddha was inserted in the 4th century BCE, and that Ananda was blamed for Mara's doing by inserting the passage of Ananda's forgetfulness in the 3rd century BCE. The passage in which the Buddha is ill and reminds Ananda to be his own refuge, on the other hand, Barrow regarded as very ancient, pre-dating the passages blaming Mara and Ananda. In conclusion, Barrow, Perzaluski and Horner argued that the offences Ananda are charged with are a later interpolation. Findla disagrees, however, because the account in the texts of monastic discipline fits in with the Mahaparinibbana Sutta and with Ananda's character as generally depicted in the texts. <laughs> Historicity Tradition states that the First Council lasts for seven months. Scholars doubt, however, whether the entire canon was really recited during the First Council, because the early texts contain different accounts on important subjects such as meditation. It may be, though, that early versions were recited of what is now known as the Vinaya Pitaka and Sutta Pit a.k.a. Nevertheless, many scholars, from the late 19th century onward, have considered the historicity of the First Council improbable. Some scholars, such as Orientalists Louis de la Vallée Poussin and D.P. Minayef, thought there must have been assemblies after the Buddha's death, but considered only the main characters and some events before or after the First Council historical. Other scholars, such as Barrow and Indologist Hermann Oldenburg, considered it likely that the account of the First Council was written after the Second Council, and based on that of the Second, since there were not any major problems to solve after the Buddha's death, or any other need to organize the First Council. Much material in the accounts, and even more so in the more developed later accounts, deal with Ananda as the unsullied intermediary who passes on the legitimate teaching of the Buddha. On the other hand, archaeologist Louis Fanot, Indologist E. E. Obermüller and to some extent Indologist Nalinaksha Dutt thought the account of the First Council was authentic, because of the correspondences between the Pali texts and the Sanskrit traditions. <laughs> <laughs> Role and character Ananda is recognized as one of the most important disciples of the Buddha. In the lists of the disciples given in the Anguttara Nikaya and Samyutta Nikaya, each of the disciples is declared to be foremost in some quality. Ananda is mentioned more often than any other disciple, he is named foremost in conduct, in attention to others, in power of memory, in erudition and in resoluteness. Ananda is the subject of a sermon of praise delivered by the Buddha just before the Buddha's death, as described in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, it is a sermon about a man who is kindly, unselfish, popular, and thoughtful toward others. In the texts he is depicted as compassionate in his relations with lay people, a compassion he learnt from the Buddha. 
The Buddha relays that both monastics and lay people are pleased to see Ananda, and are pleased to hear him recite and teach the Buddha's teaching. Moreover, Ananda is known for his organizational skills, assisting the Buddha with secretary-like duties. In many ways, Ananda does not only serve the personal needs of the Buddha, but also the needs of the still young, growing institute of the Sangha. Moreover, because of his ability to remember many teachings of the Buddha, he is described as foremost in having heard much. Pali, Bausuda, Sanskrit, Bausruta, Pinyin, Duo and Diyi. Ananda is known for his exceptional memory, which is essential in helping him to remember the Buddha's teachings. He also teaches other disciples to memorize Buddhist doctrine. For these reasons, Ananda is known as the treasurer of the Dhamma. Pali, Dhamma Bandagarika, Sanskrit, Dharma Bandagarika, Dhamma, Sanskrit, Dharma, referring to the doctrine of the Buddha. Being the person who has accompanied the Buddha throughout a great part of his life, Ananda is in many ways the living memory of the Buddha, without which the Sangha would be much worse off. Besides his memory skills, Ananda also stands out in that, as the Buddha's cousin, he dares to ask the Buddha direct questions. For example, after the death of Mahavira and the depicted subsequent conflicts among the Jain community, Ananda asks the Buddha how such problems could be prevented after the Buddha's death. Findla argues that Ananda's duty to memorize the Buddha's teachings accurately and without distortion, is both a gift and a burden. Ananda is able to remember many discourses verbatim, but this also goes hand in hand with a habit of not reflecting on those teachings, being afraid that reflection may distort the teachings as he heard them. Thus, judgment of Ananda's character depends much on whether one judges his accomplishments as a monk or his accomplishments as an attendant and person memorizing the discourses. At multiple occasions, Ananda is warned by other disciples that he should spend less time on conversing to lay people, and more time on his own practice. Even though Ananda regularly practices meditation for long hours, he is less experienced in meditative concentration than other leading disciples. From a literary and pedagogical point of view, Ananda often functions as a kind of foil in the texts, being an unenlightened disciple attending an enlightened Buddha. Because the run-of-the-mill person can identify with Ananda, the Buddha can through Ananda convey his teachings to the mass easily. Ananda's character is in many ways a contradiction to that of the Buddha, being unenlightened and someone who makes mistakes. At the same time, however, he is completely devoted to service to the Buddha. The Buddha is depicted in the early texts as both a father and a teacher to Ananda, stern but compassionate. Ananda is very fond of and attached to the Buddha, willing to give his life for him. He mourns the deaths of both Sariputta, with whom he enjoyed a close friendship, and the Buddha, in both cases Ananda is very shocked. Ananda's faith for the Buddha, however, constitutes more of a faith in others, especially the Buddha's person, as opposed to faith in the Buddha's teaching. This is a pattern which comes back in the accounts which lead to the offenses Ananda is charged with during the First Council. Moreover, Ananda's weaknesses are that he is sometimes slow-witted and lacks mindfulness, which becomes noticeable because of his role as attendant to the Buddha. This involves minor matters like deportment, but also more important matters, such as ordaining a man with no future as a pupil, or disturbing the Buddha at the wrong time. For example, one time Mahakasapa chastises Ananda in strong words, criticizing the fact that Ananda was traveling with a large following of young monks who appeared untrained and who had built up a bad reputation. In another episode described in a Sarvastivada text, Ananda is the only disciple who is willing to teach psychic powers to Devadatta, who later uses these in a failed attempt to destroy the Buddha. According to a Mahisasaka text, however, when Devadatta turns against the Buddha, Ananda is not persuaded by him, and votes against him in a formal meeting. Ananda's late spiritual growth is much discussed in Buddhist texts, and the general conclusion is that Ananda is slower than other disciples due to his worldly attachments and his attachment to the person of the Buddha, both of which are rooted in his mediating work between the Buddha and the lay communities. Topic. Passing on the teaching After the Buddha's death, some sources say Ananda stays mostly in the west of India, in the area of Kosambi Sanskrit, Kasambi, where he teaches most of his pupils. Other sources say he stays in the monastery at Veluvana Sanskrit, Venuvana. Several pupils of Ananda became well-known in their own right. 
According to post canonical Sanskrit sources such as the Divyavadana and the Asokavadana, before the Buddha's death, the Buddha confides to Ananda that his student Majantaka, Sanskrit, Majantaka will travel to Udhyana, Kashmir, to bring the teaching of the Buddha there. Mahakasapa makes a prediction that later comes true that another of Ananda's future pupils, Sanavasi, Sanskrit, Sanakavasi, Sanakavasan or Sanavasika, will make many gifts to the Sangha at Mathura, during a feast held from prophets of successful business. After this event, Ananda will successfully persuade Sanavasi to become ordained and be his pupil. Ananda persuades Sanavasi by pointing out that he has now made many material gifts, but has not given the gift of the Dhamma. When asked for explanation, Ananda explains that Sanavasi will give the gift of Dhamma by becoming ordained as a monk, which is enough reason for Sanavasi to make the decision to get ordained. <laughs> Death and relics Though no early Buddhist text provides a date for Ananda's death, according to Faxian, Ananda goes on to live a 120 years. Following the later timeline, however, Ananda may have lived to 75 to 85 years. Buddhist studies scholar L. S. Cousins dated Ananda's death 20 years after the Buddhas. Ananda is teaching till the end of his life. According to Mulasarvastivada sources, Ananda hears a young monk recite a verse incorrectly and advises him. When the monk reports this to his teacher, the latter objects that Ananda has grown old and his memory is impaired. This prompts Ananda to attain final nirvana. He passes on the custody of the Buddha's doctrine to his pupil Sanavasi and leaves for the river Ganges. However, according to Pali sources, when Ananda is about to die, he decides to spend his final moments in Visali instead, and travels to the river Rahini. The Mulasarvastivada version expands and says that before reaching the river, he meets with a seer called Majantaka following the prediction earlier and 500 of his followers, who convert to Buddhism. Some sources add that Ananda passes the Buddha's message on to him. As Ananda is crossing the river, he is followed by King Ajisattu Sanskrit, Ajatasatru, who wants to witness his death and is interested in his remains as relics. Ananda had once promised Ajisattu that he would let him know when he would die, and now, after Ananda has informed him, he follows him. On the other side of the river, however, a group of Lichavas from Visali await him for the same reason. In the Pali, the two parties are the Sakyan and the Kolian clans instead. Ananda realizes that his death on either side of the river could irritate one of the parties involved. Through a supernatural accomplishment, he therefore surges into the air to levitate and meditate in mid-air, making his body go up in fire, with his relics landing on both banks of the river, or in some versions of the account, splitting in four parts. In this way, Ananda has pleased all the parties involved. In some other versions of the account, including the Mulasarvastivada version, his death takes place on a barge in the middle of the river, however, instead of in mid-air. The remains are divided in two, following the wishes of Ananda. Majantaka later successfully carries out the mission following the Buddha's prediction. The latter's pupil Upagupta is described to be the teacher of King Asoka 3th century BCE. Together with four or five other pupils of Ananda, Sanavasi and Majantaka form the majority of the Second Council, with Majantaka being Ananda's last pupil. Post-canonical Pali sources add that Sanavasi has a leading role in the Third Buddhist Council as well. Although little is historically certain, Cousins thinks it is likely at least one of the leading figures on the Second Council was a pupil of Ananda, as nearly all the textual traditions mention a connection with Ananda. Ajisattu is said to have built a stupa on top of the Ananda's relics, at the river Rahini, or according to some sources, the Ganges, the Lichavas have also built a stupa at their side of the river. The Chinese pilgrim Zan Zhang later visits stupas on both sides of the river Rahini. Faxian also reports having visited stupas dedicated to Ananda at the river Rahini, but also in Mathura. Moreover, according to the Mulasarvastivada version of the Samyukta Agama, King Asoka visits and makes the most lavish offerings he ever made to a stupa. He explains to his ministers that he does this because t he body of the Tathagata is the body of dharmas, pure in nature. He Ananda was able to retain it, them all, for this reason the offerings to him surpass all others. 
Body of Dharma here refers to the Buddha's teachings as a whole. In early Buddhist texts, Ananda has reached final nirvana and will no longer be reborn. But, in contrast with the early texts, according to the Mahayana Lotus Sutra, Ananda will be born as a Buddha in the future. He will accomplish this slower than the present Buddha, Gautama Buddha, has accomplished this, because Ananda aspires to becoming a Buddha by applying great learning. Because of this long trajectory and great efforts, however, his enlightenment will be extraordinary and with great splendor. Legacy Ananda is depicted as an eloquent speaker, who often teaches about the self and about meditation. There are numerous Buddhist texts attributed to Ananda, including the Atthakanagara Sutta, about meditation methods to attain nirvana, a version of the Bhadakarata Sutta Sanskrit, Bhadrakaratri, Pinyin, Shanye, about living in the present moment, the Seika Sutta, about the higher training of a disciple of the Buddha, the Subha Suttanta, about the practices the Buddha inspired others to follow. In the Gopaka Moggallanasutta, a conversation takes place between Ananda, the Brahmin Gopaka Moggallana and the minister Vasakara, the latter being the highest official of the Magadha region. During this conversation, which occurs shortly after the Buddha's death, Vasakara asks whether it is decided yet who will succeed the Buddha. Ananda replies that no such successor has been appointed, but that the Buddhist community takes the Buddha's teaching and discipline as a refuge instead. Furthermore, the Sangha may not have the Buddha as a master anymore, but they will honor those monks who are virtuous and trustworthy. Besides these suttas, a section of the Theragatha is attributed to Ananda. Even in the texts attributed to the Buddha himself, Ananda is sometimes depicted giving a name to a particular text, or suggesting a simile to the Buddha to use in his teachings. In East Asian Buddhism, Ananda is considered one of the ten principal disciples. In many Indian Sanskrit and East Asian texts, Ananda is considered the second patriarch of the lineage which transmitted the teaching of the Buddha, with Mahakasapa being the first and Majantaka or Sanavasi being the third. There is an account dating back from the Sarvastivada and Mulasarvastivada textual traditions which states that before Mahakasapa dies, he bestows the Buddha's teaching on Ananda as a formal passing on of authority, telling Ananda to pass the teaching on to Ananda's pupil Sanavasi. Later, just before Ananda dies, he does as Mahakasapa has told him to. Buddhist studies scholar Akira Hirakawa and Bhabhuti Barua have expressed skepticism about this teacher-student relationship, arguing that there was discord between the two, as indicated in the early texts. Regardless, it is clear from the texts that a relationship of transmission of teachings is meant, as opposed to a Upadhyaya student relationship in a lineage of ordination, no source indicates Mahakasapa as Ananda's Upadhyaya. Whatever the case, in Mahayana iconography, Ananda is often depicted flanking the Buddha at the right side, together with Mahakasapa at the left. In Theravada iconography, however, Ananda is usually not depicted in this manner, and the motif of transmission of the Dhamma through a list of patriarchs is not found in Pali sources. Because Ananda was instrumental in founding the Bhikkhuni community, he has been honored by Bhikkhunis for this throughout Buddhist history. The earliest traces of this can be found in the writings of the Chinese pilgrim monks Faxian and Zan Zhang, who reported that bhikkhunis made offerings to a stupa in Ananda's honor during celebrations and observance days. On a similar note, in 5th 6th century China and 10th century Japan, Buddhist texts were composed recommending women to uphold the semi monastic eight precepts in honor and gratitude of Ananda. In Japan, this was through the format of a penance ritual called keka. Chinese, by the 13th century, a cult-like interest for Ananda had developed in a number of convents, which included images, stupas and ceremonies in his honor. Presently, opinions among scholars are divided as to whether Ananda's cult among bhikkhunis was an expression of their dependence on male monastic tradition, or the opposite, an expression of their legitimacy and independence. Pali Vinaya texts attribute the design of the Buddhist monk's robe to Ananda. As Buddhism prospers, more laypeople start to donate expensive cloth for robes, which puts the monks at risk for theft. To decrease its commercial value, monks therefore cut up the cloth offered, before they sew a robe from it. The Buddha asks Ananda to think of a model for a Buddhist robe, made from small pieces of cloth. Ananda designs a standard robe model, based on the rice fields of Magadha, which are divided in sections by banks of earth. 
Another tradition that is connected to Ananda is Purita recitation. Theravada Buddhists explain that the custom of sprinkling water during Purita chanting originates in Ananda's visit to Visali, when he recites the Ratana Sutta and sprinkles water from his alms bowl. A third tradition sometimes attributed to Ananda is the use of Bodhi trees in Buddhism. It is described in the text Kalingabodhi Jataka that Ananda plants a Bodhi tree as a symbol of the Buddha's enlightenment, to give people the chance to pay their respects to the Buddha. This tree and shrine came to be known as the Ananda Bodhi tree, said to have grown from a seed from the original Bodhi tree under which the Buddha is depicted to have attained enlightenment. Many of this type of Bodhi tree shrines in Southeast Asia were erected following this example. Presently, the Ananda Bodhi tree is sometimes identified with a tree at the ruins of Jetavana, Savathi, based on the records of the Chinese pilgrim Faxian .In conclusion, Ananda is one of the most loved figures in Buddhism. Although he is not as wise as some of the other main disciples, he is beloved because of his devotion to the Buddha and sincere efforts to understand and disseminate the Buddha's teachings. In art Between 1856 and 1858 Richard Wagner wrote a draft for an opera libretto based on the legend about Ananda and the low-caste girl Prakirti. He left only a fragmentary prose sketch of a work to be called Die Seeger, but the topic inspired his later opera Parsifal. Furthermore, the draft was used by composer Jonathan Harvey in his 2007 opera Wagner Dream. In Wagner's version of the legend, which he based on Orientalist Eugene Bernuff's translations, the magical spell of Prakriti's mother does not work on Ananda, and Prakriti turns to the Buddha to explain her desires for Ananda. The Buddha replies that a union between Prakriti and Ananda is possible, but Prakriti must agree to the Buddha's conditions. Prakirti agrees, and it is revealed that the Buddha means something else than she does. He asks Prakirti to ordain as a bhikkhuni, and live the celibate life as a kind of sister to Ananda. Although Prakirti at first cries of misery, after the Buddha explains that her current situation is a result of karma from her previous life, she understands and rejoices in the life of a bhikkhuni. Apart from the spiritual themes, Wagner also addresses the faults of the caste system by having the Buddha criticize it. Drawing from Schopenhauer's philosophy, Wagner contrasts desire driven salvation and true spiritual salvation. By seeking deliverance through the person she loves, Prakirti only affirms her will to live, German, will zoom leben, which is blocking her from attaining deliverance. By being ordained as a bhikkhuni, she strives for her spiritual salvation instead. Thus, the early Buddhist account of Mahapajapati's ordination is replaced by that of Prakirti. According to Wagner, by allowing Prakirti to become ordained, the Buddha also completes his own aim in life. H. E. regards his existence in the world, whose aim was to benefit all beings, as completed, since he had become able to offer deliverance—without mediation—also to woman. The same legend of Ananda and Prakirti was made into a short prose play by the Indian poet Rabindranath Tagore, called Chandalika. Chandalika deals with the themes of spiritual conflict, caste and social equality, and contains a strong critique of Indian society. Just like in the traditional account, Prakirti falls in love with Ananda, after he gives her self-esteem by accepting a gift of water from her. Prakirti's mother casts a spell to enchant Ananda. In Tagore's play, however, Prakirti later regrets what she has done and has the spell revoked. <laughs> Notes <laughs> <laughs> Citations <laughs>